Kilo Sierra, departing 3 1, South Departure Falcon. Lee, it's super exciting to have you on the podcast. This was like a pop-up opportunity. I'm very humbled to be sitting next to you, although it's a little bit closer than I like, I'll be honest. Last time I think we were this close, it was three feet away in a Mustang and an F-16. Absolutely so. right, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking, you know. <laughs> what a great thing, and it's good to be with you. And uh, you know, I think I'd rather be flying next to you in the F-16, but uh, this'll be fun. Yeah, it's not that there's anything against you sitting this close. There's just something special about when you got an F-16 or any fighter next to a Mustang. I know I think I've told you, and I've told this to other people, but like obviously I fell in love with the Mustang as a young kid, that Merlin motor. The surreal piece of it is when you're in an F-16 with double hearing protection on the wing and you can hear the motor inside the cockpit. Like it's incredible. It, it truly is. You know, one, one of the most special things of flying Heritage with you and, and is the ability to ramp the airplanes downhill for the run in and uh, you're thinking about you're gonna have to pull it back and and uh, I'm, I'm telling you can you push it up a little bit in the f-16 so that uh, I don't have so much problem staying with you right. the, uh, which is slightly different than when you know you fly with an a1 sky raider I'll uh, bet yeah it's a it's a slightly different piece I think in fact it was pretty cool because we kind of back up to where we first met and then we're gonna we're gonna jump back into where it all began for you but where we first met Sun and Fun 2017 but you were at that point, you were done with the Heritage Flight Program. You had stepped aside, you're continuing with your business, which again, we'll oh, get to. Oh, go ahead and say it, I aged out. Well, I wasn't gonna say it. I mean, for those <laughs> that are listening, while he sounds really young, he might have tripped an age point, which, I mean, that, you were one of the ones that kind of helped set an age point for Heritage Flight, right? It's, it's very interesting the way it works in life. So I was 55 years old and sort of tasked by the leadership of the Air Force from the civilian side to come up with an age requirement for the civilian pilots. And uh, at that time we had several guys that were into the 70s and stuff. And uh, being 55, airline preference or, or priority, uh, 65 seemed to be a really great number that could be justified uh, in, in the eyes of the leadership of the Air Force and and the public throughout. So 65 was written down and no kidding, it seems like I woke up like three months later and I was 65 <laughs> years old. I'm going, who wrote that silly rule? <laughs> and and so I I dug my own hole. <laughs> but I will stand by yeah. and say it is I stand by that age. It was a good time. It was a good time to pass it on to other people and I have no regrets for doing it. Do you think that age is and I know it, it depends, right? Everyone ages yeah. differently, but and at some point you have to draw a line in the sand. When it comes to like flying warbirds or flying heritage flight specific, and again, for those listening, heritage flight, you got modern Air Force fighters flying alongside warbirds, P-51s, P-47s, you know, P-40s. Do you think there's something about doing that that is inherently different than flying in just a warbird act in an air show that you need to have that age limitation? Well, Rain, I think you hit it. Everybody's different. But if you look at, at you said drawing a line in the sand that, that makes sense, um, the Air Force has done so many things and made so many rules written in blood, which is a term you guys use. Yep. And, and uh, so it's a common sense test. Uh, we're flying, you know, aircraft fairly close to each other, F-16, F-22 Raptor, and uh, so in the aviation world we, we all tend to, the smart ones, err to the conservative side. And right. that was an error to the conservative side. And as I said before, it opens up the opportunity for some other kids to kids or you know obviously mature aviators right but to have the opportunity I was part of the heritage flight program for 18 years yeah. and uh, you know I had more fun than anybody alive going up and flying with you guys and watching you and, and watching your demos and, and uh, you know so do I miss it yeah but it was the right thing to do yes it was yeah at some point you have to say you used to and being able to say you used to and going out on 
your terms, I think is a, that's a big win versus the other way around when they're kicking you out the door because you just hung on a little too long. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you a good example. Frank Borman was one of the original Heritage Flight pilots from the civilian side. And uh, Frank one day came up and he said, you know what, I'm retiring next year and for the betterment of the program. And uh, he was approaching, I think, the, the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, he made that determination. So we, th we thought that, okay, here, the, the trend is set, you know. Yeah. But, oh no, <laughs> the, the fighter pilot mentality of never say give up right. <laughs> sort of prevailed. So uh, anyhow, it was a, the irony of making a rule and having it catch up to you uh, is something I laugh and giggle about today. Well, so I'm gonna to jump to where we first met because this is applicable to this story, but that is something that you hit on. It's really tough, like for Frank, like I admire that because you're in an amazing program, doing amazing things that's a lot of fun that a very, 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 very small percentage of people ever get to do and just have either the wherewithal or whatever it was going on to say, it's, it's my time to step aside when he could have continued. And he could have continued that to a point where maybe he definitely shouldn't have been doing, but to have that self kind of. Yeah. Well, we're back to the air on the conservative side and, and your aviation career, mine has been, has been based on that. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a good policy for any aviator, you know, uh, yeah, you can push and you can get away with it time and time again, but after a while, you know, fate's gonna catch up with you. Yeah, at some time, you're gonna have to pay the bill, yeah. and, and hopefully it's not the ultimate price, because again, it's an unforgiving business. So one of the ironies of the whole thing, pardon me, I think no, I interrupted this, you, no, this is, good. is that, you know, they brought me back on board again to help train one of the new guys in the <laughs> you, did. you Okay, yeah, you did interrupt me. You did interrupt me, now I get to it. Because, yeah, you were past you were very old at this point. Oh, here we go. Yeah, well, yeah, pa yeah, well yeah. past 65, <laughs> aged out of the program. Uh, but yeah, you came back for one more round. I guess you heard there was a new guy and you went to fly. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Air Force said, could I help out here a little <laughs> bit? And, but what a, what a great way to get back into it. For me, I was super excited. Yeah. I believe you were ferrying a Viper from the West Coast to down to Florida to Sun and Fun. And, uh, I think we both had to qualify each other. Right. So if I remember right, we went to the Avon Park range and called those guys up and you were supposed to hit a tanker and uh, I forget what happened to that. And, but Not good. here you come out of, I don't know, 45,000 feet or something like that. And it's like, wow, and we went right to work like we've been doing it forever. And that, uh, That's what's really cool about it. It's like, again, I remember the first time I saw you was the glint from 45,000 feet because it was you and Andrew McKenna hanging out in yeah. Avon Park, <laughs> descending through some of the busiest airspace like in the country uh, to rejoin on your wing. And like you said, like, we went to work. And then you brought us up initial at Sun and Fun, which that was, my, that was my second air show and talk about a second air show because it's Oshkosh light as far as the traffic, but it's really busy. So I was glad to have you leading me in there <laughs> alone and afraid so i appreciate that well the beauty of the whole thing is working with professionals and you know all the guys that the fly the fighters are obviously professional and, and you know you're one of the rock stars of the people that i got to work with so it was a it was a no-brainer it was like show you once let's go to work and and uh it, it was a real privilege to get to fly on your wing and fly lead for you. Likewise, very humbling. I only had to pay him $100 to say that, so <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. And it was cool because that weekend, I think originally like the approved plan was for like one flight and done, and we worked it to a practice. Well, we needed a, you know, another practice. I think we squeaked out like four extra sorties in that. Well, I, you know, I think that was the case, but my recollection, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but yes, we did. We, yeah. uh, we, we worked all the angles and well, the main thing and is to be safe, and so to be able to go out there and get the, the training we needed to go out there and execute yeah, properly yeah. was essential that we get, get as many reps as possible because, you know. Well, that's exactly right, and, and uh, again, to step in, and the whole program was so special, that, and uh, I think we recognized early on that the Heritage Flight program being brought in front of the public became a zero 
tolerance. Yeah. Uh, first guy that, as we said, swap paint program, major jeopardy more than likely go away. And, and the, the people that uh, were involved, I think, respect that. And if you look at you look at a program that has had so much impact to the public uh, over the years, and I, I believe the Heritage Flight is going, I was 18 and seven, probably 25 years now. Yeah. And with, as far as I know, no incidents, no accidents. That's That speaks volumes of the people involved in it. It does, because obviously, you know, just as well as I do, if not better, like uh, air shows are very dynamic. Lots of weird stuff happens at them. And then not to mention you're throwing in airplanes that have 70 years of technology differences in between. Some like to go fast, some like to go slow. And you mix these variables in, it can, you can paint yourself into a corner very quickly and make a catastrophic mistake that is unrecoverable. And like you said, you do that once, the program's done. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's over. We're flying for the program, not for ourselves. So let me ask you a question, no, Ray. Man. And now the, now, the, <laughs> now the microphone turns. So being, being a young fighter pilot and coming up through the ranks and now flying a Viper, did you ever think you'd get to fly a formation in an F-16 with a P-51 and a Sky Raider and all these other really classic you know, aircraft? Absolutely not. I do joke with my wife, I was like, one, if I backed up 10 years ago and said, this is where I'll be, not in a million years would I have guessed. And even like five years ago, same question, would not have imagined. It's funny, I actually saw you fly at an air show when I was a kid. It was a Viper demo. Oh, that you, hurts, that hurts. I mean, based on your age, <laughs> it makes sense. You know, just the huge differences between us uh, that I was very young. Uh, and you were, I mean, just- I'm get, sorry, were you in diapers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but how, I mean, how cool, is, like, seeing Viper Demo and the Heritage Flight at a young age, I mean, that was the, sh that was the centerpiece of the show. That was the hook um, for me, but I never imagined in a million years that I would have the opportunity to go out there and do it. Yeah. Which is just, it's so cool and so humbling to have been a part of it for just a fraction of the time. Because you do see the impact with people reaching out and, and, you know, I ran into uh, a guy here who's starting pilot training next week saying that seeing me fly and having met me at a previous show and talking like that's one kind of, maybe he's blowing smoke up, right? And like making me feel good about myself. But I do think there are people who get exposed to the Harris Flight Program to get exposed to a demo that maybe it opens up an avenue that they didn't realize was there. And Well, the influence and obviously uh, part of the demo program, part of the Heritage Flight is, is a recruiting tool 100%. and uh, very, very effective. And ironically enough, you know, you can go up there, in my case, upside down, right side up, pull high G's and use sort of the same thing. But when you come back and you ask the crowd and they go, that was so cool when you guys were flying, something so generic, they have right. such great impact after you pull your heart out, right. and, you know, and, uh, you know, same way in my, in my stuff. So. It's interesting because the influence, as you said, as you were hopefully kidding about being in diapers and watching me fly. But uh, ironically enough, the same thing happened to me with Bob Hoover. When I grew up, sort of a family of aviation, but one of the major influences on my life was watching Bob Hoover as a teenager fly a P-51 Mustang. And I'm just going like, wow, how cool is that? You know, and I saw your performance at Sun and Fun my first year. I did not see it yesterday. I do apologize. But I know in Sun and Fun you did a dedication, a, a maneuver dedicated to Bob Hoover. Did you do that yesterday? And can you walk me through that? Yeah, I, I, I do that very selectively in right conditions. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the show lines here are not prevalent too. But it, it was the Bob Hoover touchdown, roll the airplane touchdown. And... Uh, you know, but it, it's a sort of a site-specific yeah. uh, thing. So uh, the answer is no, but uh, you know, how do you, I, how I always do you, think how, of it. How do you fly that, and what is that maneuver like? Because watching it, I realize there's a few things going on there, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> some, some cockpit management, uh, a few variables you're, you're weighing and, and, and adjusting. The, one of the hardest things to do with a Mustang is to slow it down. Um, it, people may or may not know it. It doesn't have speed brakes like the Viper. Um, and it just, 
once you get it rocking and rolling, it just doesn't want to decelerate. You can pull the power back and it just keeps right on going. Uh, so the first challenge is slow the airplane down to where you can get into a flap configuration and get, get the gear down. The gear on the Mustang is actually 150 knots, which is actually pretty slow. And it's, yeah. Because of the big clamshell doors that open up uh, before the wheels come right. down or, or back up. And uh, so that's a limiting speed, which is hard to come by. And yeah. so you got to get to that first, and now you got to get the airplane slowed down further right into the profile uh, and the right attitude to touch that wheel down. And, and now it's scrambling to get the power back up, get the nose up, get the, get the roll all the way back around, and now touch down on the other wheel. And uh, it's, it's, it's a busy time, and it's got, you know. It, it looks busy. How much runway do you want to have to do that? Yeah. I like I like seven thousand feet as an absolute minimum, and you know, okay. uh, so ironically short. enough, DM is where I started doing that because okay. of the big long runway and, yeah. and sort of packaging it up. But uh, yeah, I feel like a thirteen thousand footer is like a happy. Yeah, exactly a happy right. Spot yeah, I'm going, I I could I don't need to run out of runway on this whole this whole thing. But uh, anyhow, just a tribute to those guys, and and you know, Bob Hoover was a major influence on my life and flying and. And uh, ironically enough, uh, I got to know with him, got to know him uh, from uh, some of the Arnold Palmer days that, that I did, and and we visited a lot on flying airplanes, and flew with him at Reno, wow. uh, flew with him in the Shrike Commander, uh, flew with him in the Saber Jet. Yeah. So we had we had this whole whole thing going, and uh, what an honor to you know. As a as a young teenager, absolutely to now get to fly with him is is what you sort of the same thing, yeah. um, and the influence it's had on my life and flying the Mustang has been, you know, monumental. And uh, other guys that are the icons, uh, Robin Olds, uh, flown with Robin Olds, requalified him to fly the P fifty one. That's awesome. And Bud Anderson and and uh, flown with a Tuskegee Airman. Flew with a guy named uh, Irving uh, Reddy, who his last combat mission in a P-51, he got shot down. And he came one day and he said, I'm a fighter pilot. My last mission in Mustang is not gonna be when I get shot down. Yep. Let's go fly it. And put these guys into the front seat of the airplane. They're like a duck to water. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah, so. Did I see it right that you flew Colonel Anderson yesterday? Or did you get him in the car or get him in back in the plane? No, I know I okay. didn't. Maybe it was a, uh, it was a reach here. When, did, yeah. But you flew him, right? But this was this was like back in the 80s okay. when he was still flying and, yeah. and Chuck Yeager was still flying Mustangs and stuff. And, and uh, so. Because it's incredible to see, I mean, he's 100 years old and he's still like sharp as a tack. Oh, he is. He's, he holds court. Uh, yeah. It's amazing, you know. Well, that's the first time I heard him talk was in the motorhome. Uh, that you had down That's there. exactly right. And, I mean, my yeah, you know, my jaw was just on the yeah. floor the entire time, yeah. just listening to him talk. And it's just an incredible honor to be around him, let alone like hear him tell some of his stories. Doesn't get any better now. Two blondes and a beverage, right. and, and <laughs> right. he was going on for the better part of two hours. <laughs> right. And, but those are the special times with with those guys that did it for real. I mean, you're yeah. you're a real fighter pilot, and and uh, you know, combat and all that. But these guys flew those airplanes. The, into combat many, many times. And, Do you it. know, I've been blessed to get to fly the Mustang and very peaceful, you know, nobody shot at me yet. And, yeah, uh, that you know of. You know, yeah. That You're I down know there of. in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all really cool. Uh, another one is Bruce Carr, uh, triple ace in the P 51, okay. and uh, requalified him. And, and I'll tell you a short Bruce Carr story. So, requalified him. And he actually soloed in a D model okay. after recurrent with me on the TF, the dual cockpit, dual control P-51. And uh, so his paint job, very distinctive, called Angel's Playmate. And uh, so the owner of the airplane came to me and he said, what do you think? And I said, hey, he's good to go. And so he went out, we did it as a two ship. I sort of flew chase for him. Yeah. And he soloed after, I don't know how many years, probably, 50, 55 years, the Mustang again. And he's like a 21 year old kid. And he's probably at that point, 72, yeah. 
73. And uh, so he comes back and, and uh, just, as I said, like 21 year old, bounces off the wing. Awesome. So next thing I know is he comes to me and he says, hey, I convinced the owner to let me take the airplane to Oshkosh. And I'm going like, okay. <laughs> and so I figured the best way to do this is the two ship. Yeah. And uh, Bruce Carr was actually on, on the, one of the first Thunderbird teams, the basis of the Thunderbirds. Okay. One of the first guys. And, and uh, so put him on the wing, he never moves. Yeah, just rock solid. He just right yeah. there. And, and so we go to Oshkosh, I've got the lead. And, and uh, all goes good and we do a little bit of stuff up here but now it's time to take the airplane back to florida to the base and uh so i'm going to latrobe pennsylvania to go back to work with arnold palmer and bruce carr is supposed to take the airplane back to south carolina and so we brief we check the weather everything's good and i go and he goes He's going south, I'm going east. And uh, so my leg's only about a little less than two hours. And yeah. I get there and the first thing I want to do is make sure he's okay. And uh, so I get there, nothing, nothing. And then I get a phone call and he's going, hey Lee, Colonel Carr. He said, the weather didn't look so good in South Carolina. So I decided to go to Tennessee. And I look at the weather in South Carolina and it's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Sky's I'm going, clear, not a cloud. Okay, yeah. Good decision. Good decision, Bruce. Okay. And uh, he said, I'll get it there tomorrow. And same thing the next day. He went somewhere else the next day because the weather wasn't that good in South Carolina. It took him like three days. That's... He took the airplane, just like the family car. Right. And the 16-year-old going to see every girlfriend he had. Yeah. Well, that's sort of Bruce Carr. He went from buddy to buddy, holding court. He yeah. finally got the airplane back to South Carolina and God bless him for it. Safety first. <laughs> you can never be too safe and call you out. The weather doesn't look good. That's you know? exactly right. So Don't push it. That's the cast of characters those guys were. And, and you know, Robin Olds and Bob Hoover, all those guys were just spectacular individuals and very, very talented fighter pilots. And, well, it's incredible that you were able to fly with some of those guys, and I want to jump into that to go, but I think we need a backup to you and really what got you involved in aviation and how you kind of progressed to the fact that you're ripping around in a Mustang all day long, just racking up time, and you're, you're the epitome of Mustang training and Mustang flight. So where did it all begin? Well. As I said earlier, I, I grew up in an aviation family. My dad was a naval pilot okay. and, uh, and some, did some test work after the war. And uh, so he really promoted that. And there, there are five boys in our family. And, and uh, so I started flying gliders actually at 14. And uh, I saw a Disney, a Disney movie um, about flying with the condors. And, and uh, that sort of planted that whole thing. And, so gliders at 14 and then soloed on my 16th birthday. And all I wanted to do was be a fighter pilot. I mean, that was my goal, right? Yeah. And uh, cause you're reading about guys like Hoover and, and all the guys that we just talked about, right. you know, they're, they're iconic guys and, and uh, what a great role model. And, but in my f growing up, I realized also that I didn't have 20, 20 uncorrected vision. And I figured, you know what, being an optimist, I'm going, I'll figure this out. And uh, so I got my commercial and my instrument rating and my CFI and all the way through and ended up going to LSU on a scholarship and uh, majored in aeronautical engineering and I was in ROTC. And uh, so finally it came, you know, they're always recruiting and stuff. Right. And like, okay, how about taking these tests and we'll, We'll sort of see where you fit into the Air Force. Well, having a lot of experience in aviation, I stored really well on the on the written tests for this whole thing. But when I got to the flight physical, there was like I could not read the 2020 line, and that's when they had the draft lottery. And and uh, I didn't short a nuclear war. They were never going to call me in. Yeah. And so I tried to negotiate that. I'm, I'm going like, okay, I'll sign up for 10 years. 
just tell me I can fly anything. I don't care what it is. They're going, you're not going to fly. You're just not going to happen. It's not a deal. And I tried the Navy. Yeah. I tried the Marines. I tried the Air Coast Guard. Yeah. And it was the same story across the board. And in a sense, my dreams were shattered, but it wasn't like an instant decision. I sort of knew that. And uh, so fast forward, okay, if I can't fly the military, I can fly civilian aviation. And, and uh, shortly after college, I ended up going to work for Arnold Palmer. Okay. And uh, so I was like 23 years old and, and uh, flying a Lear 24 and with a great guy, an F-105 pilot, right. uh, a guy named Charlie Johnson. And uh, I went from part-time co-pilot to full-time co-pilot. Uh, Charlie retired, went to work for uh, Case Learjet in production flight test. And I became chief pilot and uh, went up through a series. But my dream was never, you know, never give up, you, you know. That, and so. That's some, so there's a piece there because you obviously were told no, 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 no. I know it didn't end up in military aviation per se, and you ultimately ended up a heritage flight out there flying around with military jets, which is pretty cool. But there is a theme there, I think, that there are other avenues and there's other things. And like maybe that wasn't your path, but had you gone down that path, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today. Yeah, that's so true, Rain. Um, ironically enough, and I tried to convince Arnold Palmer to buy a P-51. He's going, why would we do that? I go, well, how about crew morale? And how about proficiency? Well, it, it, didn't, it yeah. really didn't work. And uh, so I, ironically, in 1987, well, I, I first flew the Mustang TF dual cockpit, dual control airplane, like in the mid 70s. And I'm just going, it's you know, it, it, it was truthfully, and I said this before, it's almost like big neon sign that says, this is what you're supposed to do in life. Yeah. Go figure it out, sign God. And you just go, yeah, okay, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but ironically enough, in 1987, the Naval Test Pilot School put out a contract for an aircraft that was virtually a P-51 to teach the test pilot students about a lot of the torque effects and things that are academically studied, but nothing in the inventory that they could see it. And uh, with a partner at that time, um, Doug Schultz, who was a Navy guy, um, we bought the most expensive P-51 Mustang in the world for, I think it was like $450,000. Told the bank that we had a military contract, told the military we had an airplane and everything crossed in the middle of the night. And so in a sense, I learned to fly the airplane from a test pilot, the Mustang from a test pilot standpoint. Did you have any tail, so you're flying for Arnold Palmer, which, how did you land that job as a 23 year old? Now you jump into a Mustang, did you have tailwheel time? Oh, I had lots of tailwheel okay. time and, and flown a variety of different airplanes. Were you flying a bunch of T6s? Yeah, and, I flew T6 a little bit, I flew all kinds of Super Cub stuff. And, and uh, you know, the Mustang is not a difficult airplane to fly, but I'll put a caveat, it's a difficult airplane to fly really well. And you being a professional aviator, I think you understand that. Um, so the transition into it really is not monumental. Uh, a little bit more challenging when your your job is to keep a naval test pilot out of trouble in the airplane. Right. And uh, we, the envelope was pretty pretty opened up, and uh, but it was a great way to learn the airplane that I still used today in, in flying the airplane 35 years later. And uh, so, but to the gist of where I was going in this long, short story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what podcasts are, you know. So, and in a sense, I had to develop my own fighter squadron. And, and if you look at our operation down in Florida, the template is a fighter pilot template. We have ops desk, we have a, a full-time flight surgeon on staff, we have leadership professional pilots, and the military has brought that and, and such a great example to how to run a professional flight operation. And so I didn't reinvent the wheel. 
I just took their template and said, okay, let's convert it to a civilian sense. And uh, I would, I would uh, rank our flight operation among any in the world. Uh, well, I mean, I think it does pretty well. I mean, you, you pump out a lot of students, not only in the P-51 each year, but you're doing a lot of other training. Can you, like roughly, how many people do you think you've trained? Do you know how many you've trained? Well, let's, we have graduated, I think, 217 graduates of the program. Okay. That would, from a military standpoint, that would be equivalent to like a Top Gun or fighter weapons program. Yeah. Uh, very, very demanding. Uh, and very high standard of, of uh, what you do and how you do it. And, and uh, not everybody graduates. Uh, you can't buy your way through the program. Uh, we don't change the standards. And uh, I would like to think we've made a, a big difference in the safety record of the high performance propeller driven airplanes. And, and uh, so uh, we've trained that, but flown. <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of people on the airplane doing sort of like the military, what they call FAM flights. Right. Uh, we call them orientation flights, which is, oh, by the way, page one of the syllabus. And you get in there and they go, hey, can I go for a ride to Mustang? No, you can't really go for a ride, but you can fly it. I'm very high, highly qualified instructor. And uh, that would be like you going, hey, you want to go fly the F-16? I go, right. yeah. Count me in. <laughs> of course, right? Um, what? So, what, how much P fifty one time do you have? Uh, gosh, almost two and a half years ago, I, I, I passed the ten thousand hour mark in the P fifty one. So it's been two and a half years. So I don't know, approaching eleven thousand, ten five somewhere. I quit counting after ten. Yeah, like I. That was it. I, you know, it was a. A milestone, and, and Rain, the irony of it is, the closer I got to the number, uh, the more concerned I got about, you know, the fighter proud, don't screw it up now. Yeah. And and uh, so I, I sort of started thinking about everything, as a matter of fact, overthinking. And uh, so the 10,000 hour mark came and, came and left. Yeah. And uh, I was happy to see it go. And then I don't know, Angela or one of our other people said, wow, wouldn't this be great that your 10,000 hour mark is actually at Sun and Fun, which is only like three weeks away. And I'm going, oh, here we go all over again. Now I'm gonna do it in front of, you know, 10,000 people. And, and oh, by the way, do it in the demo world. Right, no Which big you deal. know is a little different. Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> and uh, so I, I took a deep swallow and said, well, okay. and and got through it, but I was happy, very happy to see that mark come and go. And, and my promise to myself was stop counting, go back to work, do what I do, how I do it. And, and uh, so, but uh, been really blessed to get to fly the Mustang that much. And that's incredible. It's like, it's like, didn't they give you an F-16 when you retired? I know, I think I was cheated on that. I was on the way out, they didn't give me one. So well, I got to follow up. Well. <laughs> The blessing is, I you know I can go to work and eeny meeny miny mo. I, yeah. yeah, I'll fly that airplane today. And so, the irony of it is that yeah, I get to fly fighters. Are they current state of the art airplanes? The answer is no. But I'm still flying them 35 years later and haven't been promoted out of the cockpit yet. So That's I don't know who wins or who loses, but I'll take this route. <laughs> I'd say it's a pretty good route. It's pretty yeah. you know like it's pretty okay. To push it best, as I like to say, it's really special. It it uh, is just an incredible airplane. You got such a deep history and, and combat record of the airplane. And ironically enough, when you go on on the TV and you know some of the places they start to rate the airplanes and and stuff like that, you know you you got a thump on your chest when the Mustang still comes in number one. It's a crowd favorite. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter who you are. That Merlin motor, it's just something about yeah. it. What is the toughest aspect of the Mustang to you? Um, feeling the airplane. Um, the Mustang is very much um, a feel aircraft. The, the sensories that it gives you, uh, I've written several articles on it. The Mustang talks to you. Um, 
you know, I'm, in the sense that I'm sure the Viper talked right. to you. Uh, but the Mustang's even more of a feel. There's no artificial stall warning on the Mustang. There's no buzzers, bells, whistles, tones, yep. uh, anything. Or, oh, by the way, a computer that says, okay, that's all I can give you, boss. What, <laughs> what now? Makes you lazy. <laughs> yeah. So learning the feel of the aircraft, uh, and, and that gets into flying it really well. Uh, that's one of the things we really try to transfer over uh, in the fighter pilot world when you guys are really doing ACM, whoever can turn the tightest is going to eventually win the fight. So in the Mustang world, okay, the best turn rate or radius is going to be just the tickle of a little bit of a buzz in the airframe. And uh, that's not easy to acquire. There's a learning curve to it. Uh, and not everybody can get it because everybody's a little different sensory wise yeah and uh so that's a that's a really big part of the airplane from the performance side is uh getting that feel down and getting getting to use it as a tool to fly the aircraft um, pretty straightforward the airplane directionally um, take off and landing uh, is not that challenging or demanding you can what they call ground loop it yeah. Uh, things of that nature, um, and certainly been done a lot in the past. Uh, torque roll and go around is another great. I've heard the go around's pretty. It's pretty busy. I mean, is that because of the torque roll and flaps are moving? Well, and... it's about as difficult as the F-16. <laughs> now it is a little busier, <laughs> go, but it, it's right. overstated. Yeah. Like so many things, Rain, uh, in the high performance world, there are things you do, things you don't do procedures and certainly the Mustang even today would be considered a high performance aircraft Absolutely. and so if you're doing things out of sequence you're doing numbers that don't really work then you're setting yourself up for that classic what they call torque roll and uh, uh, it's it's a, uh, a project that I'm working on because in the vernacular, if you call it a torque roll, that's the engine torque wanting to torque the fuselage and you don't have controllability to counter it. And uh, in all the years flying the airplane, uh, I'm very, very convinced that I can control the torque until I stall the wing. Okay. When, once that left wing stalls, then that airplane will go ahead and torque over. So. I'll ask you, being an experienced fighter pilot, is that a torque roll or is that a wing stall? Which chicken or the egg came first, right? I don't know. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm going, that's a wing stall, but it's easy to talk about, and, and now you got to go, we'll prove it. So I'm doing a project with a buddy of mine, Scott Urschel, and to present Society of Experimental Test Pilots about documenting, is it a wing stall, and now proving it. So wing. we've got a test boom, we're putting on a Mustang, we're putting all the sensors and control inputs and instrumenting the airplane, so. Which is conceptually, like hearing you talk about it, it would make sense that if the wing is still flying, that you should be able to control the torque. I mean, I don't know Mustang torque. I know it's a lot of it, but I can buy that concept that if that wing is still flying, you should be able to control it and yeah. counter it. Yeah, like, and, and you can do that up until you put just a little extra G on the airplane. A little, little too much. <laughs> yeah. A little, little too much. And then stuff. hang on, because the, the airplane's gonna, gonna roll over. With all your experience and all the years, what are some of like, the biggest mistakes? What is the biggest mistake you think guys or gals can do that potentially can lead to unrecover? Well, it doesn't have to be just warbirds. Uh, flying in general is a dangerous business. Um, and the standard fire pilot answer probably, it depends, applies here, but I want to, See if you got something that you've seen over the years that gets people. Well, this is going to be really sort of a different answer than I think you're looking for, but it's sort of a, a parallel to it. The Mustang can lull you to sleep. The Mustang is such a spectacular airplane to fly, and, and sort of like the Viper, I'm sure. Yeah. You sort of strap this airplane on. You, you get seated in it, and it becomes part of you. And uh, so in a sense, the, the Mustang makes you look really good. 
very quickly. It's like the Viper, it's easy to fly, you know? Like. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and then you can get, you know, into believing, yeah, I really am good. And then the airplane can humble you very quickly. Uh, again, back to high performance thing. It's got edges, it's got corners, it's got things you do and things you don't do. And uh, if you exceed one of those margins, you're off to the races and, and uh, it can be a pretty wild ride. And uh, so the whole thing is to don't get overconfident in the airplane. So many guys have and a simple air show repositioning turn not feeling the buffet and pulling through and departing the airplane uh, and it takes substantial altitude to recover has what, happened over and over you know the final turn is a, is a big killer you know in aviation where people stall and they're down low to the ground and there's no chance to recover because they spin it um, is that you know i imagine that is a regime in the mustang that's still of concern but if you spin it like what altitude are you looking at? Like you need to be able to, you need yeah. to have to recover it. This goes back to the Bob Hoover stories of, we talked a lot about spinning the P-51 because he was, he was really involved in a lot of that. And we actively spun the Mustang up the Navy Test Pilot School for many years. And, and uh, it's plan, it, to the left it spins uh, upright, very flat. And uh, ironically enough, even doing the right spin recovery control inputs, it still takes a while to get that yeah. move down to where it recovers. And, and so to answer your question, uh, an upright spin is, is losing about 1,500 feet per rotation flat. And uh, it'll take sometimes five, 6,000 feet to, to get it out of the spin, to get the nose out of the vertical and back to a level flight. So it, it takes a while and it's an, it's not repeatable every time. I, I've seen very stable, flat. Uh, I've seen fairly wing rock oriented flat. To the right, I could recover on a heading. It's very conventional, but to the left, because everything's left torque it's go, it's generated. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, it's like, okay. And uh, so, and it's pretty tough on the airplane because of the gyroscopics of that propeller system. Uh, we were tearing engine mounts out. We were really? we were actually digging the the spinner into the cowling of the airplane. And no kidding. my brothers, we were talking about yeah. five boys. Two of my brothers are the best P-51 mechanics in the world. And they finally said, you know, if you don't quit spinning the airplane, we're going to stop working on it. Because I was tearing engine mounts out and gouging the cowling. And that's some serious, so, yeah. like force. That's that's occurring yeah, there. It, it truly is. And gyroscopics are such a big player in, in that airplane that uh, yeah it, it makes some interesting dynamics that's wild if someone wants to get checked out in a p51 what does that training look like what would an ideal training profile be well our profile is is like a seven flight syllabus okay um, you're bringing obviously credentials and experience to the table uh, the first flight is from the rear cockpit what we call rc1 and uh, it's a basic, uh, as you would in the Viper, okay, feel, sight, sounds, the big picture of, okay, what we're, what we're working with here. Right. And then based on tolerance, putting them right into the front cockpit and then building a foundation. Uh, the Mustang is a really uh, interesting low speed handling quality airplane and, and pretty amazing if you, again, have some feel for it and the experience of doing it. And uh, so we build on that into the, into the uh, higher performance Buffett, Buffett tracking drills, and obviously all the emergency procedures, the EPs and uh, engine failures and zero flap landings and full flap landings, crosswind, all the stuff you do. And, but it's a 10 to 12 hour program for the fairly talented uh, person coming in. Um, Another fun short story is Bill Anders. I trained Bill Anders, okay. you yeah. know, around the moon, Bill, yeah. uh, astronaut. Photo. And uh, the guy was absolutely like a, like a sponge. You show him once, you, t you tell him something and he's got it. And uh, so he went through the course in like seven, 7.2 hours or something. And uh, which was an absolute slam dunk record and, and uh, well-deserved on his case.
I mean, he did go to the moon and fly around that, take some. Pretty yeah, cool, you, yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, so I was like, yeah, he probably, he probably yeah. has this. If anyone has a skill set, uh, maybe Bill Anders. Absolutely. So uh, he had a son, Greg, who a ten pilot. Oh, BA. BA, BA yeah. Anders, who part of the Air Force Heritage Flight Program, and uh, so he sent BA to come down to go through the our checkout training program before he'd let you know, him BA fly the P-51. And, and so I worked with both of them personally. And, and so finish up BA, same thing. I, I mean, DNA and, you know, professional military aviator, A-10 guy, sticking rudders, all the right stuff, good yeah. tailwheel time. And, and so we went right through the whole course. And, and uh, so, hey, great job. And goes home and flies the airplane. And, like two weeks later, I get a call from, from General Anders, and he's not happy. And I'm going like, what? And he's going, you changed your standards. I'm going, what do you mean? I, General, I didn't change our standards. He said, you had to. I said, no, sir, actually, we didn't change our standards. If anything, we made them a little bit higher. Well, that can't be right. I'm going, what are you talking about? He said, well, Bill came in, or BA, yeah. Greg came in about two tenths of an hour less than he did, That's and he wasn't happy about <laughs> that. Yeah, I didn't know about that. But yeah, I flew a lot of air shows, but he's a great, great human being. Yes, he is absolutely. And so I laugh and giggle about it today, a, <laughs> and I still don't think he's happy about it. <laughs> it wouldn't be. I I can understand that. Yeah. That's a, that's awesome. So, and I told him, I said, General, you can be proud of your son. Absolute rock solid. Yeah. It wasn't a rounding error though, Dad. You know, yeah, yeah, good yeah, hear him saying yeah. that. The, um, the the EP training part of it, I I heard something about this, and I don't know if it's true or not, but you have a little bit of engine out time in the Mustang. You shut the motor <laughs> down in the in the Mustang. I, short short answer, yes. Let me put the caveats in yeah. there. There's no um, trick. So again, back to the t Naval Test Pilot School and and learning the airplane. Uh, if you look at the Dash 1, the flight manual for the P-51 Mustang, it's got a little excerpt that, that says for every 5,000 feet, the airplane will glide 14.5 statute miles. Well, that's military test pilot. And, and so, but we're flying different airplanes today, lighter weight. And so the, the Merlin engine being a water glycol cooled engine uh, you can't really shock cool it. Okay. And so I talked to the engine manufacturers, and again, I sort of grew up flying gliders, and uh, started doing a, a program of, okay, uh, engine shutdowns and looking at that, and then did a very dedicated program, a whole glide analysis on the aircraft, looking at different prop configurations uh, for the propeller pitch, looking at flaps, looking at uh, gear, all kinds of turn bank angles and uh, did a whole analysis from a test pilot standpoint on glide and then realized the value of that in the checkout training program so between the test work initial work and then repeated test work um, over a number of years i started counting the engine out time and and uh this is this is all on purpose right. and <laughs> all orchestrated and, and padded and right. you know controlled but about two and a half hours of engine out in the p51 that's and, a, uh, so and it glides actually very well 150 knots is the baseline okay for an average airplane but uh ironically enough a lot of what north american came up with was you know we re-verified a lot of it and we looked at a heavy tf and a light d model and uh, so, yeah, it, it's sort of interesting. Uh, you say slightly interesting. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty interesting. And when you say two and a half hours, you know, for those who like maybe have not flown a plane and been engine out, like, oh, well, two and a half hours, that's like watching a movie. Like, that's not really that long, especially when you compare it to like over 10,000 hours flying the Mustang. But 10 and a half hour, or two and a half hours, that's a lot of time when you're probably engine out for just a couple minutes at yeah, a time. Yeah, it, it was the segments. We started, we started 14,000 and do the shutdown, and then we'd we'd do a recovery at, at five, 
with our men for the SFO back into the airport at three. So it was normally a six minute profile. Six minutes at a pop, that's yeah. a lot of time. You know, 10 of them, you got an hour. Yeah. And uh, so, and do we do it in every checkout training program? No, we really don't. But for the advanced guys, the guys that have their own airplane, the guys that are really doing this stuff day in and day out, it's really a, a great tool to go on, hey, been there, done that. It's pretty quiet. It, it, uh, it gets yeah. real quiet in that airplane. Yeah, not going what I haven't experienced that. I mean, the nice thing, modern, you know, the Viper, you have the sim, and every time you go, you go into the sim once a month for emergency procedure training, and you're probably going to have three to six engine out scenarios. And while it's different, I think than it would be in the jet because you know like if it doesn't work out in the sim you're still not riding a rocket on the way out um, it does allow you to practice so the first time this happens it's not oh crap I mean there's still going to be that to a certain extent but sure it is. you can just yeah. kind of get into it and having seen it once I think is well the beauty thing. of it we we got to really from a training EP standpoint we reassessed or reconfirmed or confirmed, however you want to look at it, uh, how do we duplicate that glide performance in today's P-51 Mustang? So in the normal training for, I think you guys call them SFO, simulated flame out, uh, we use sort of the same vernacular even though it's propeller driven. Uh, the high key and, and how you're going to make maneuver the airplane uh, to a landing position. So we can now really go, yeah, what we're teaching is absolutely verified that, yeah, this is the way it works and this is the way it'll happen. So um, it, it's a really confidence builder that, okay. And, that, uh, that's huge. So it, it uh, pretty well. And so far the engines have been good. And, uh, obviously for guys that have Mustangs, I, I'm not recommending you go up and do this. That's, it, right. you know, the caveat <laughs> there's, is. <laughs> there's, uh, the, there's the disclaimer. Yeah, you're coming from controlled environments, and I think as we kind of wrap up here, I do want to say or ask you if someone is interested in doing this. You've obviously been doing this quite a while. Where can people find you, and where can they go if they want to pursue something like this? Rain, if you just look up Stallion Fifty One uh, or Mustang or Crazy Horse, it'll take you to a website and uh, pretty much. Uh, into all of all of what we offer from the training standpoint, the orientation, and um, obviously I still do a little bit of air show work. And, yeah. and here we uh, here we are. How yeah. long ago did you retire? I've been out for like three years. I mean, it's great, you know, to, to date this. We're going to be coming up on six years since we last flew together. That's you know? amazing. So, yeah, that I'm not sure that's right. I I know <laughs> we have to we have to play back the tapes, do some math. Well, I I, I keep checking my age every year and. I do the math and I go, and that can't be right, so I get a calculator, but the answer continues to be the same. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's not. Yeah, you know, but uh, it's funny, I think things just kind of, it's cliche, right? But life seems to speed up. I know, yeah. like I've heard it, you've heard it, and like I think tri once you trip into like your mid 30s, like I start believing it. I'm like, what happened? That was a year just went by. And it so does. I know it's going to just keep going by faster. Yep. Yeah, every, everything they say is true. Yeah. In, including every every year after 25, you start putting like a, a pound on in your body. <laughs> right. <laughs> I still feel like I'm 23, but for some reason, like my body can't keep up with that. Yeah. Like my well, neck hurts, my back hurts. Yeah. Wait till wait till you get you know 70. <laughs> Just keeps getting better. Well, Lee, I always like to ask my guests as I wrap up. If you found 15, 16 year old Lee walking down the street, is there any advice you would give him? Tell him to do something different, change this or do that. Rain, I, I really would, and in, in, in my life, there, there are two things. One is um, find a passion. Find out what you really enjoy doing, and then passionately pursue it. And the other is, and, and certainly in my case is, never give up on it. Um, yeah. You know, it may not be the direction uh, of how you're going to get to your destination, but go this way, go that way, but don't ever give up on your dreams. Um, th that would be my message, and, and yeah. I didn't, and uh, it turned out to be a real blessing, you know, to come to Oshkosh in 2022 and fly a P-51 Mustang in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people. 
no big never deal. Never one, it's a real honor. Yeah. But it, to me, it is an absolute kick to, to get to do it. And, and, you know, I laugh and giggle. And after 35 years of flying the Mustang, somebody goes, well, what do you want to do tomorrow? I was like, yeah, I'd like to go fly the Mustang. <laughs> it never gets old. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I get to do it. Yeah. And uh, I get to do it and have a whole lot of fun doing it. So stay passionate and never give up. I mean, that's right out of the fighter pilot manual, was it not? Yeah, I mean, it's it's to the point. And I think, you know, prime example, I think your initial game plan of being a fighter pilot in the military did not go the way you saw it was going to go, but you never gave up. And now, again, you're sitting here with, you know, 11,000, almost 11,000 hours of Mustang time under your belt with one of the premier, if not the, the premier P-51 training program in the nation. Uh, in the world, because then people come all over, which you probably couldn't say that had you ended up flying whatever in the Air Force. Maybe, maybe it would have worked out, but you probably wouldn't have met Ar Arnold Palmer, you probably wouldn't have pursued, you know, so it's and funny how all right. it, it, tend, it tends to work out, it seems. It does, so n never say die. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Lee, I really appreciate you joining the podcast. my honor, Rain, always yeah, thank really you so much. Uh, real privilege to get to fly off your wing and, and uh, Always a highlight in my life. Well, and I can say, you know, from being that little kid just down there watching you fly, and then, you know, fast forward. Oh, here we go to yeah. the diaper <laughs> deal. <again. laughs> Lee, it's truly, it's truly an honor to be able to flow with you, call your friend, and, and be able to chat today. So thanks so much. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. You take care, my friend. You too. See you. Yeah, there I was. I mean, the, the, there I was segments I think everyone really loves because it's just a, it's a standalone, something slightly different. So I'll let you take it away. Awesome. So, Rain, uh, bird strike, a uh, big thing in the military aviation and stuff, and obviously uh, in Mustangs and the speeds we fly and things like that. So, um, always a concern. Absolutely. And uh, I'm a falconer. I fly birds of prey, and, and so the study and things. And, and one of my things has always been the birds are very, essay, situational, aware of their surroundings, and, and you hardly sneak up on them. And uh, so, if you see a bird, I've always, from the helicopter world to the Mustang world like that, I, I've always tried not to miss the bird, but let the bird miss me. In other words, remain predictable. Right. And so, uh, in a in a P-51, and and uh, I've got a student in the front, and all of a sudden we're going through this flock of vultures, and and sure enough, he tries to miss the bird, and. It comes up right over the canopy, actually bounces over the top of the canopy into the ventral fin of the vertical and wrapped it around to like two or three times. Yeah. And we've got cameras on the airplane and up on the tail. And so you come back and obviously the airplane's got some, some damage to it. And my brothers look at it and they're going, well, we want to see this on the video. And ironically enough, we go to watch the video, the video tape player failed. And they're going like, ah, we could have at least seen it. Right. So anyhow, they repair the airplane and life goes on. And like two years later, we're coming back and uh, the uh, Aningas, the, the sort of the snake birds that um, they sort of snap roll and tumble yeah. if they see you coming and, and things like that. And we're coming into the pattern only like 150 knots. And I see what I thought was traffic made a big change because the student was flying the airplane from the front. I have the aircraft and I'm just gonna remain predictable. He snap rolls, goes under, and you feel the impact on the airplane. I'm going, gotta damn be kid, Gotta be kidding me, yeah. And so, yeah, you gotta be kidding me. Here we go again. And I'm looking around to where the impact was and can't really see it. We land and stuff like that. And, and sure enough, the bird only hit the camera lens, which is the size of a nickel on the vertical stabilizer, the only damage to the airplane was it cracked the camera protective lens. So no kidding. you got this little crack in there. And so now we go back to the video. And I got it right this time from the video because, and a bad day for the bird. And, but the very last thing, the last frame of the camera was. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so it reaffirmed my whole thing. Remain predictable and let the bird do the maneuvering. If I'd have just stayed there instead of trying to 
get fancy right. and go underneath him, it would have worked out just fine. But it takes sometimes two takes to, to get the, the results. Do the right photo. That's it. <laughs> what a pleasure. But likewise, I really appreciate it. Lee. Thanks so much. I got to get the photo now. We got to go find where uh -oh. that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome.